Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you've joined us for this episode of Stay Curious. We are broadcasting today from the Holiday Inn Studios, the Titusville Holiday Inn. We thank them so much for hosting our memorabilia show this weekend. That was a big success. Show you a few pictures of that here in just a second. Uh, but we thank them and the whole staff there, Sean and Ashley, uh, first-rate uh, program there. We did some lessons learned in this inaugural event, and we'll certainly continue it at this location next November and have another uh, memorabilia show. But uh, basically, we, we raised uh, uh, almost $5,000 for our gallery collections. That's what we wanted to do. And again, we'll see a few pictures about that in a second. But... Uh, we want to thank everybody as we look at this beautiful picture of Space View Park and the uh, shuttle memorial there. This is what we're all about, folks, is preserving the birth of the American Space Age in its delivery room, Brevard County. This one-of-a-kind uh, tribute to our astronaut heroes. This is the shuttle area there and the, the pylon you see on the left uh, with the names on it uh, uh, have space workers on there including my co-producer and friend marty winkle hey marty how are you doing good mark well how good i think okay? i think the i i think the, i think right here is the pylon it's got your name on it or it could yeah. be this one over there right there I'll show you. all right but uh this was all financed partly by a hundred dollar donations we put your name up there on the uh these pylons and in the Apollo gallery area we have um there you're over on that one yeah you can't see me well you can't see me. okay well anyway you can see that column but it's there well uh hundreds of shuttle workers up there we got Apollo and uh uh Mercury and Gemini area there also in this park uh the beautiful uh, stainless steel triangle and shuttle there uh uh, is is uh, and the the whole shuttle history is on five sides around the big marble um, monument in the middle there. All that was etched on there. We're very very proud of that. So uh, uh, and uh, city's doing a good job to keep it cleaned up at our sometimes nudging once in a while. All city parks have their problems at times. Uh, this one's had its fair share, but we're trying to keep it clean. We put busloads of kids and senior citizens out there all the time to see our Space View Park. So hope you can come and enjoy it one time. But uh, hope you can enjoy on the West Coast a total eclipse of the sun of the moon tonight. This is when the moon goes into the Earth shadow. It's not even going to start Eastern Standard Time till around 4 o'clock, and the moon's going to set at the partial phase. So anybody east of the Mississippi River is not going to see anything. The mid-eclipse is at 3 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, okay? So that's 6 a.m., and the sun rises at 6.38 a.m. here at, in our uh, neck of the woods on the Space Coast. So this is unfortunately an event that people in the Rocky Mountains and West will, can get up early and enjoy it. Uh, it will be broadcast live on, pl on platforms like NASA TV. But uh, the uh, moon, as it moves through the sky, and actually the moon moves its own diameter every hour. It moves a half a degree to the, the east every hour. So in a 24-hour period, it moves 12 and a half degrees to the left or to the east. Well, the moon's actually moving into the shadow that the Earth casts into space. Everything casts, casts a shadow, including us human beings, all right? When the sun's low in the sky, we have a long shadow. When it's high up, it's a short shadow. But everybody casts a shadow, and, and the big cone of light that the earth throws into space you don't see it out there because it's it's like a shadow you can see the sidewalk through a shadow right but the stars you can see twinkling through the shadow but when the moon passes through it it picks up the color from the lensing atmosphere of the earth the sun passing through our atmosphere acts like a lens and because there's pollution there it shifts to the reddish end of the spectrum and that's why the that we will have a blood moon eclipse, they call it. This total eclipse will last about an hour and a half. 
astronomers will be able to look at darkened areas. They might even see a flash of light uh, on the surface of the moon, which would be a meteoroid hitting. And we have Taurid meteors right now known for their big streaks in our atmosphere. So we might see a meteor impact. Uh, but once again, NASA is going to uh, and other venues out there will be broadcasting the eclipse tonight. Uh, and once again, it begins at um, uh, 3.09 a.m., uh, no, 4.09 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1.09 Pacific Time. Totality begins at 2.16, all right, uh, and lasts uh, for about uh, an hour and a half. And we're not going to see any of that in the East Coast, but those of you on the West Coast, let us know what it looks like. Uh and hate missing these lunar eclipses because they're they're slow and beautiful uh, just the opposite is the solar eclipse when the sun is covered up by the moon and those just last for minutes on end but this is this will be a fun event the Parkinson said they'll see it from 7 p.m to 10 p.m in, in australia oh is that what uh, uh who's who's telling us that cliff watson cliff watson okay cliff Yes, you get a good uh, midnight view there. Thank you, Cliff. And Cliff, thank you for your support of our our program here. He's a good buddy in Pomona, Australia, Cliff. So uh, uh, thanks to you, mate, for uh, donating to our museum financially. We appreciate that a lot. And we have various ways for you to donate, including the stars on Facebook, or you can go to our face our website and make direct donations there. And if you want an earmark for Stay Curious, Karen Conklin, our executive director, will make sure the money spent on our Stay Curious video podcast. And the Native Americans, uh, uh, they um, talked about the eclipses of the moon. Uh, I'm going to remind you of that again. Think about what the Native Americans call the moon, uh, full moon of November. And we'll tease you with that and tell you about that later. Well, we want to thank everyone for helping us with our memorabilia show Saturday. It was a big success, thanks to these two gentlemen and Delaware North. Uh, the, the two gentlemen there to the left is uh, Chuck Jeffrey, and to the right, Ken Havocott. They're in our Rocket Garden. Thank you, gentlemen, for sponsoring our our event. Chuck had a mini auction that went real well. Ken is support, support, supporting us with um, all kinds of uh, memorabilia for schools and so forth all the time. But uh, Delaware North, thank you for your financial support. Delaware North, of course, is the business uh, worldwide uh, agency that is in the vending and restaurants and management of ballparks, stadiums, and amusement parks around the world. And Kenny Space Center is one of their crown jewels for sure. And we thank them for reaching out and uh, giving the American Space Museum a nice check to support our event uh, with their help. And uh, the money we raised, over $3,000, we cleared easily for our general uh, use in our galleries. We wanted our gallery um, manager, Nick Enix, to have a budget. He's never had a budget in the five years. Nick and I have been here uh, with Karen Conklin uh, taking our museum to the next level. So now we've got a little bit of a budget for Nick to look at and improve some of the things he wants to in our in our very uh, cool and fascinating museum. Those of you that have been here know you'll see things you'll never see anywhere else. A uh, couple great pictures there is, is uh, Steve Izzo in our little table there before we let the throngs in there. Uh, and we had free uh, entrance, $10 donation. People were more than happy to help us out. This woman brought this for appraisal, uh, a beautiful quilt she made. Those are patches, real patches of every shuttle mission and then some. Her first quilt, forgot to get her name. We have it wrote down somewhere, but this was a beautiful, awesome uh, quilt that at first, Chuck Jeffrey appraised it around, oh, eight, nine hundred dollars maybe a thousand to the right person. But in the upper left where Steve's holding it, I pointed out to Chuck was a a, uh, a rare STS-1 patch where the flames are four different colors. You have an eight hundred dollar patch if you have an STS-1 Columbia patch that the orange goes to red uh, and uh, yellow and gold. 
uh, flames there, four distinct color threads. And she had that on there, and Chuck goes, wow, that, that almost doubles the price of this. So very interesting day. There's Marty at our table there uh, talking to uh, 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 Dave. Dave Kalaji. Yep, Dave. We hope to have Dave in our museum helping helping us out there. And uh, so, uh, again, thank you, everybody, for supporting us. Uh, the online auction went well. We learned some things. Uh that uh, we're going to make it a briefer day, not 9 to 5. It's going to be 10 to 3 next year, and we'll have the auction probably around 1 o'clock there of, of some various items there. But, uh, Marty, what did you think about the, the uh, show, our first uh, show out doing this? I think in spite of being a first-time event, it was, uh, it was great. I saw a lot of people, a lot of you know, people, a lot of people we know from uh, State Juris, like... Uh, uh, William Whiting was there. Yep, William Whiting. Hey, Thank Bill, you. good to see you. Talk to him there. Uh, we had people from our astronomy club. Uh, Carl, uh, Carlton Bailey was a vendor there. Thank you, uh, Tori Varquette. All right. Uh, uh, all the vendors were happy. Everybody made money. It was a win-win, and people got some gifts and for Christmas and some treasures from the space age at the... Uh, uh, aren't available anywhere else so uh we'll grow on this and like i said thank you to the holiday inn uh for excellent excellent they were fantastic weren't they marty uh accommodating us all the way around and uh we're going to have it at this event again next november we'll let you know the date soon all right let's segue to the big buzz in the county now is this rockets out there picture i took a few hours ago from space view park that's with the equivalent of a 600 millimeter lens, okay, uh, handheld guys out there. And there's Artemis on the launch pad, uh, threw some pretty flowers in the foreground there. That's what a, that's what a professional photographer does there, right, Mark Usiak? And Mark was out at uh, up at the crack of dawn, to, well, before dawn, to get the launch of Northrop Grumman's Cygnus to the International Space Station. And I didn't throw a picture of that in, uh, but uh, Mark, uh, I did put your picture on our Facebook page there. But uh, there's Artemis out there. I'm going to go out there tomorrow morning, uh, maybe out to the beach and get a little closer shot of it uh, out there uh, uh, before the sun gets too high up. And uh, maybe show you another picture of that. But it's getting getting exciting around here, Marty. And uh, though this is kind of an interesting anomaly that uh, when they were going to launch at August 29th, all right, in like 9 in the morning, boy, that evening was just so much fun. Uh, all night long, the media, uh, our German TV friends were there. Uh, we had a blast, didn't we? And hotels were full. And then they've had two scrubs, okay. And I asked some of the hoteliers over the last week, over the weekend, are your hotels full for the the uh, Sunday night, uh, Monday morning uh, at twelve oh seven, I think it is, yeah, twelve oh four, the fourteenth. And most of them are about half full right now, Marty. If people haven't uh, checked in on Sunday night uh, or Saturday evening uh, for this thing, like they did. Uh, back in august 29th and that's just human nature i guess you know if you have a couple scrubs and people's schedules and whatnot but we will have a big influx of people from orlando for sure uh and around the state when when this thing uh is go at about uh, nine o'clock ten o'clock about nine about seven o'clock when it's go you can see we'll see a bunch of people coming on the roads i guarantee you and that reminds me that friday we're going to have uh, Amy Matthews, uh, the public information officer of the Titusville Police Department here on Stay Curious with one of her officers to give you some tips about traffic and where and where not to watch this launch on Sunday night, Monday morning, 12.04 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The window of opportunity is about 69 minutes, and then they've actually got six days in a row that they can launch Artemis. Uh, it, each day it pushes the launch back uh, 15 or 20 minutes earlier into the night or deeper into the night. So I have a good feeling it's going to roar off the pad, Marty. How about you? Well, I don't think I'm as optimistic as you, but hopefully it will go. 
All right. Well, it's got five of your SSME engines that you babied through 135 shuttle launches there. We know those are going to work perfectly. And uh, those two gigantic pop bottle rockets on the side of it. So there it is. Of course, that's the orange orange parts, the fuel tank. We're looking at it sideways there with the Orion spacecraft on top. So those gigantic 600-foot, three of those uh, uh, launch electric towers there. So, all right. Oh, and we wanted to tease with Delaware North. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about being out at the Space Center today. And uh, uh, we've kind of gotten into a routine where uh, myself, Marty, and a couple other volunteers uh, like Connie uh, McDaniel and uh, Anita Truex, our, our paid um, office manager, we're trying to go out there and support this uh, astronaut encounter on behalf of the museum and we learn a lot because after all you're hearing an astronaut every day out there you're bound to learn something that we can share on stay curious today's astronaut of the day was terry wilcott pilot twice commander twice two missions to the mir space station that's mark smith there at the podium mark pinch hints for nick thomas we'll have nick uh, mark on the program one day on stay curious uh but there is the astronaut autograph section on the second floor of the memorabilia building. And we're going to take you out to Kennedy Visitors Complex, not to brag that we can go out there any day of the week. It's a $150 annual pass, for gosh sakes. Of course, you would do that if you lived here. Uh, right, Dave Stangy? And, uh, but, uh, so we're going to throw a picture up there throughout the week and ask you, Where's Marty? Where is Marty, my buddy and co-producer in this photograph? Okay, so take a look around there for a few minutes, uh, and uh, let and I, and then we'll come back to this picture as to where's Marty. It might be where Mark is one day. All right, or or, or where's Connie? You'll never see Connie though because she's she's pretty uh, slick when that she she hides when that camera comes out. Let's just put it the way it is. But we appreciate Connie McDaniel being in our studio and learning our Streamlabs here. Uh, so maybe we can give Marty a break one day. But so we're going to have some fun with this, show you what it looks like out there. We know, hey, every time I went out there, folks, and I turned around and looked in that rearview mirror as I was driving away from Kenny Visitors Complex, I was always going, when's the next time I'm going to be here? Is this the last time, you know? And uh, so we know how it feels, but we want to take you this. They've really freshened up the merchandise building there. There's two floors. Uh, it, it's really awesome. And there's your astronaut autographing some things there today uh, that they do for free. Or you can buy it. They limit you to three or four items. And then you got to walk through it again. So uh, here is uh, Marty. Uh, and that is a marine fist pump. Marty's already pulled his fist back, but when... Marty's told uh, astronaut Terry Wilcutt that he was a Marine also. There was a big oorah, and they fist-pumped each, uh, each other there. So I thought that was very cool. This is a very nice man. Uh, Marty, as we go out there and see these astronauts, there is a distinctive difference between the test pilots, that are the pilots and commanders of the shuttle, and the mission specialists, okay? And that difference to me, Marty, is... These guys are pretty serious all the time. Not not serious, not having fun, but they just have a demeanor about them that they're in control. And Terry Wilcott, as, as calm voiced as he was and so forth, when we talked to him one on one, uh, up on the, when he did his presentation, talking to him one on one, you really got a, an impression that he was a personal guy and a good commander. A couple things in his talk we'll share, Marty. Uh, as we're looking at that picture of you there, and, and and where's Marty in our picture here, is he said the shuttle flew like a fighter, and, and he was surprised at that, in that after two decades of the three-decade program, the simulators were very accurate to how it felt to fly in there. And this is a top gun, Terry Wilcott here. Uh, he's a, he was a top gun guy. 2,000 switches in there. Uh Marty, how about he said that they did a survey in the astronaut corps uh, if you would drink your own urine, if they could prove to you 
that they made it cleaner than any water you've ever drank on Earth. They wanted to recycle urine in the space station. And uh, he said all but one astronaut was positive that they would drink their own urine out of like the oh, probably 100 astronauts in a survey there. I found that interesting. He also said, you'll never feel healthier in your entire life than when you're in space weightless. The air is purified through filters, so there's no allergies, there's no aches, there's no pains because your spine, your muscles aren't, aren't, aren't taxed like they are on Earth. Um, uh, what do you remember, Marty, if anything specific? Well, I was just thinking about that, and I just got what I was going to uh, say about it. Oh, you, have, you don't get the aches and pains. Yeah. You know, your, your back, your knees, are usually, not usually, they're, you don't have the, uh, the, the skeletal structure type of pain. Right, right. On Earth. Yeah, he didn't say about getting any space sickness or anything, and uh, which which most do. Uh, uh, his favorite food was Italian MREs, he said, are real po are popular. Uh, they do eat a lot of MREs on there. He said the food was good. Uh, uh, he had an interesting photograph of how your, your uh, food was put in a pack, like a, a box that's like uh, two feet long, but only like eight inches wide. It was like pulling out a, uh, oh, maybe a library, uh, a catalog of magazines or something like that's where your food was in always learn something new this guy was on the mirror space station twice uh which he said was interesting uh he told us that uh, when they docked with the mirror space station the commander he's the first commander and then they shake hands with the other with the russian commander and uh Terry Wilcutt says, we're, we're like, okay, we got this list of stuff we got to do. Where do you want us to put stuff in? We got stuff for you. We're going to be bringing in stuff. And he said the Russian commander went, niet, niet, no, no, no. You've come follow me. Put your work down. Follow me. And they went to where they ate supper uh, in the Mir space station. And these astronaut cosmonauts that were there hadn't seen a human being. Uh, Wilcutt and the other astronauts said they forgot about in months and they just wanted to talk to some human beings and they sat down and traditionally have uh, water and and salt is a good luck uh, uh welcome and uh i suspect that the russian guys may have had a little vodka because wilcutt said that he sat down to eat with them one time and they pulled out a pack of crackers and in the crackers was a tube of vodka vodka is prescribed to russian cosmonauts after a hard day's work by their doctor to have a little jigger of of alcohol to calm them and like Wilcutt said you'd never find any alcohol near anything in NASA all right uh, so uh, but Triple T's told us about the gallons that was smuggled on the last shuttle mission to the mirror uh, by Russian cosmonaut uh, uh, Ru Ruyman uh, so uh, that was a cute little story there but I think my favorite story he said was his last mission STS-106 and let me consult the shuttle scroll here 106 was in, um, uh, yes, uh, September of 2008, Atlantis. Wilcutt took a crew up there to space to our International Space Station, the fourth flight, to drop off hardware and supplies. And for the permanent crew coming up there, the next crew, uh, and it's been com continuously occupied for 100 uh, for 22 years. They left little alien stickers and decals and stuff on the windows little green men he says what were they left on some of the and i'm sure they leave a lot of jokes and gags and stuff uh uh to scare the pants out of them i know some of them uh used to uh put the manic make mannequins out of the space suits and have them in like shaking their hand as they walked on board and that sort of stuff. So, you Terry will cut. We'll be out there again tomorrow at the internet at the Kennedy Visitors Complex. So you will not want to miss him out there. One last look there for y'all. Where's Marty in our picture at the Visitors Complex there? So, well, yes, Marty. They say he thinks I'm. I'm. Uh, where to go? Dave Stangy oh, says what? Upstairs, talking to the gentleman with the hat. Right oh, center. okay. He's, he's, uh -uh. He says you're upstairs talking to the gentleman with the hat. Yep. Okay, nope, that's not right. The gentleman with the hat and the white shirt is uh, Mark Smith. Uh, he was the astronaut wrangler today. But uh, 
Well, Marty, you are you're as you're as handy as a pocket to have around sometimes, you know. And taking you out to uh, to the visitors complex is always a treat. And you and I went out there with uh, 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 Anita and Connie uh, the other day, and uh, it was so delightful. Marty, tell us what we're looking at here. The real deal. Well, I'm not so much detail you want, but the real deal has the lunar module. But that's a real lunar module that was yeah. going to be on the moon. For what mission? Why isn't it sitting on the moon? Well, the... that's Limb 9. And Limb 9 was going to fly on Apollo 15. But Apollo 15 was going to have the uh, lunar rover. It's going to be a three-day mission. That was going to be. It was. So you need an, an, an excuse me, extended duration lunar module. Uh, Limb 9 was not extended duration. So it did not fly. So it was, it's a, you actually worked on this. You walked all around it. You sat inside the uh, ascent stage there doing your thing as lead electrical engineer. Um, and uh, so I, fo I focused on one thing that Marty told me that just, just flabbergasted me uh, on the back there. But go ahead, Marty. You wanted to say something else. No, I'm good. Oh, uh, but uh, we're looking, of course, at the front here. Uh, very accurate spacesuits uh, there, too. It doesn't say if they were used in training, or I, I don't think they were used on the moon. They wouldn't have them open like that. Uh, there's another astronaut behind the flag covering the porch there. So technically, the porch, and when you go left of the porch looking at it, that's quad one. Quad two and three are the, are the, the sections behind, and quad four is to the right of the, the ladder. Where and that's where the uh, lunar rover was, but when we were looking at the back, uh, uh, I said something to well, just look at that real close, and I'm going. There's no covering over the back of the uh, quads three and four there, and Marty's going to point or circle there that you can see the ascent engine is exposed. There's nothing covering it there. And Marty, how many models have we seen of the lunar module? And none of all of them have that that area covered up. But clearly, you did not cover that area up. But please explain to everybody quickly, or you don't have to be quickly. What what's the dark metal? What's the orange metal? And what's the gold metal? Okay, but but Mark, we we do have models here in the museum that shows this opening between ascent and descent stage. You just not to be sassy about it but you just have to know to look there okay yeah. but the uh the, the silver part but there's the state the, the, that's the ascent stage with the hypergolics uh the engines up there yeah. there's like a hump of a volkswagen bus in the middle where uh uh yes the, the astronaut slept on marty sat on it to uh do his job and have his work checked but go ahead marty Okay, that's just it's just aluminum. That's the aluminum structure. Well, not structure. It's the aluminum covering, if you will. Uh, that's the inconel. It's a part. Oh, there's three type of metals. The only one I remember really is nickel. Uh, but then that's throughout most of the a lot of the uh, ascent stage and descent stage. Inconel. I N. Yeah, the N I stands for nickel. Okay. Yeah. In inconel. All right. Yeah. And, uh, the AL part, I'm sure, is aluminum. Um, a lot of people will call the, the gold that's on the lunar landing strut, that's mylar. But a lot of the collectors, including our friend Jeff, uh, Jeff Jeffries, says it's, dang, it's um, uh, Capton. It? Capton. This is Capton. It's more of an orange color. It's a lot thicker. It's probably... 20, 30 times thicker than the mylar. So, so, but anyway, the collectors, again, including Chuck, including uh, Ken Habakkuk, will tell you that the gold mylar is Capton. And including the Neil Armstrong Museum that had a piece of the gold foil calling it Capton. Now, the Capton was also used on the command module. <coughs> Correct, Marty? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Well, and and why? What, what? Tell us why these materials. What purpose did they serve? Why were they special? And they were actually in bolts of, of like fabric, correct? Well, yeah, well on the uh, the mylar, yes, the mylar was uh, laid, and 
We were all around a decent stage behind the Inconel, behind the Capcon is Mylar, and it's 25 layers of, of Mylar. That acts as insulation to help keep <clears throat> blue the module cooler and is in, a, uh, in, fr it's in front of the sun and it gets it warmer when it was in the shade. It also acted as a micrometeorite shield. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the Inconel acted as a micrometeorite shield also. All right. Well, thank you, Marty. I know you're all fascinated to hear Marty talk about the still the only spacecraft built to be uh, controlled by humans and flown only in the vacuum of space and designed to lift off another world. All right. And Marty, what would, and go ahead, buddy. It's the first and to this date the only vehicle designed to be flown standing up and the only vehicle to be designed to land and then take off. Correct. And also the only manned vehicle without a heat shield for re-entry. There you go. Which was critical a lot, mainly on Apollo 9, which you know, they've been in Rusty Slider. Well, you can't get much closer than this, uh, looking through glass, of course, or plastic at the uh, lunar module simulator they have at the Kennedy Visitors Complex. And uh, Marty Point, you were gonna, you were teasing me with uh, what one of the objects is in there. So, uh, oh, I was asking. I was asking Mark, let me get my arrow back. <laughs> okay. Well, there you look out the triangular windows and the ascent stage, and right where the arrow is, probably uh, uh, is the door. And you're talking about what are those black things there? Mm -hmm. Those two black rectangles. Now, there's the rendezvous windows to the left. All right. So those weren't windows to look out. Well, this is the well, docking window. Okay. Yeah docking window and then um so um my guess is they those black uh, rectangles are uh air fresheners <laughs> <laughs> all right air fresheners and i'm sticking with it <laughs> well then i'm sorry mark but you're wrong okay i'm the first time this month <laughs> oh darn it and the month is just started what what that is and the same thing on the on the floor. Show sure what we're looking at up there. That so we're talking about. Right. Yeah. The, these these black two black uh, rectangles there. Okay. Yeah. They are cable restraints. Cable you, restraint. Yeah, you didn't want the astronauts flying around to have cable restraints on their flight suit down to the the, to the floor of the deck. Uh -huh. You also had cable restraints going up. Huh. Just to keep them from. So it's like a sling under their 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 or their armpits or something to, to stabilize them or more on their waist. Yeah, more on their waist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, forget about that. That they had those uh uh I'd like to imagine that checklist, secure your cable restraint on there. Very good. All right, Marty. Well, there's a beautiful full moon rising over the uh uh, tree line in Pennsylvania. Mark Usiak took that last full moon, the uh, October full moon, which of course was the harvest moon, exactly the hunter's moon this year. What do we call the full moon of November? All right. Who knows what we call the full moon of November? And we being the Native Americans of our great country uh, would have names, as did all cultures, the full moon was so important over 200 years ago because it did provide extra daylight during the day, during the night, when they could hunt under that light, they could walk and travel. I'm sure that the, you know, some of the men got up in the middle of the night and maybe some of the women and couldn't sleep. So under the light of the moon, maybe they did some chores. Uh, so uh, hard to always put your mind back 300 years ago in our great country, all right? Uh, just in the 1700s, uh, 1720s, you know, uh, when there was no electricity, everything was completely dark and everything was a mystery to the common man. Well, the full moon of November is called the beaver moon. And the semi-aquatic rodents, uh, this was the time when beavers would had already built their dams. They were starting to live in them. They were out there foraging, getting fat. Their furs were getting all 
the uh, beaver pelts were getting all thick and, and shiny. And that's when the trappers out there wanted to catch them, when those pelts got really full of, of hair and so forth. So uh, the beaver moon, for uh, various reasons, is what November is called by many Native American tribes. Uh, and then come around December, uh, we'll have full moon the first week of December this year. Uh, they called that the cold moon, duh, uh, or the Yule moon, uh, or the long night moon is another name for the full moon of December. But uh, the beaver moon is going to be uh, rising tomorrow uh, at uh, 5, today at 511. So today's the day to go out on the ocean or above the tree line or your mountains or a building and get the moon rising It'll look full to you uh, with the ambient light of uh, still illuminating the landscape for you to get that beautiful picture like Mark Usiek did here. Uh, and full moon will rise at 546 tomorrow. Now, the horrible news is sun sets at 533. Okay, now that we're on Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so sun setting today at 5.33, sunrise at 6.38. So uh, uh, we're losing, we're, we're in a period now where we have more nighttime than we do daylight. And the only people that really relish that are the stargazers like me, because heck, at 7 o'clock, I can be looking at Saturn and Jupiter and bagging some, some nebulas and galaxies in my telescope, having a big time under the stars and, find, and get to bed. Well, get inside by, by 10, 11 o'clock at a decent hour. So uh, that's one of the advantages of, of Eastern Standard Time to amateur astronomers. So, And again, remind you of the eclipse of the moon. All right, you west of the Mississippi, particularly west of the Rockies, are going to see it if you get up early. And if you're going to get up, get up at about 3 o'clock on uh, Pacific uh, Coast time, 2 o'clock in the Rocky Mountains, you're going to see your full moon covered up and looking dim and like a bloody red moon because of the coppery uh, uh, nature of the atmosphere uh, uh, being refracted in the pollution of our world here. So we hope Doug Forrest is in L.A. Doug, you know that you're going to get up and watch that. And uh, send me a picture, Doug, if you see it out there. Uh, William Whiting, great to meet, uh, see you again over the weekend. Robert Law is in Dundee, Scotland. He's not going to see any eclipse. Carlton Bailey, uh, thank you for staying awake, uh, Carlton. Uh, no, we saw Carlton today. Uh, and we're going to start seeing more of Carlton's photos on our Stay Curious program and Facebook. Paul Forrester, thank you for staying curious today. Dave Stangy and Cliff Watson. Uh, he is already enjoying November 8th in Australia. He's into Tuesday. We're just winding down Monday here on Stay Curious. We want to make sure that you don't forget about our wonderful seven astronauts orbiting the Earth on our International Space Station. That is Frank Rubio. Cosmonaut Dimitri, JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata, the man is his nickname, astronaut Josh Cassida and Nicole Mann from NASA, and Russian astronaut Sergei and Anna. Anna, they're just the fifth uh, Russian woman to go to space in their 61 years of orbiting the Earth. Over 55 American women have gone to space, so the 72 that we've totaled have orbited Earth. So they're doing great things up there. This is what the space station looked like 22 years ago uh, when uh, three, uh, two cosmonauts and Bill Shepard were Expedition 1 crew. We're up to Expedition 68 now, 22 years later. This is what that fabulous facility looks like, doing things that you can't imagine every day to improve life here on Earth. So... Well, where's Marty? He's going to show you in our... There's Marty on the second floor down there. Getting ready to, to buy a few gifts or two. So thank you for playing along with that, everybody. Thank you for enjoying another program of Stay Curious here. Coming to you from our Hyatt Place studios 
inside the American Space Museum, not Hyatt Place, Holiday Inn Studios at the American Space Museum in downtown Titusville. So we're going to do it again for you tomorrow, Wednesday. We're going to have <coughs> um, the voice of NASA, Hugh Harris, with us. Friday, we'll have Amy Matthews, public information officer of the Titusville Police Department with one of her lieutenants or captains with her to talk about the uh, how to be safe this weekend coming in to watch the Artemis launch on Sunday night, a little bit after midnight Monday morning. So, Marty, anything else we need to uh, clean up on Streamlabs today? Well, it's rainy in L.A., so Doug Forrest isn't going to see too much of a eclipse. Ah, raining in L.A., huh? Well, you got uh, some a few hours for it to clear out, but yes, we're getting ready for another tropical disturbance called Nicole. Thank you, Nicole Stott, for that. Uh, but we'll be teasing her if this... Uh, but things should be good for the Artemis launch. We're going to have a rain event they're predicting uh, that's never good uh, on the shoreline here with the uh, barriers and so forth, so tenuous on our space coast. But uh, Ro Artemis rocket out there, it'll be just fine, and weather's supposed to be beautiful come Saturday and Sunday. So I'm optimistic we're going to see one heck of a launch Sunday night, Monday morning, and we will be here to tell you all about it and build up to it this week. So on behalf of our wonderful museum here, and uh, thank you, Marty, uh, for running a great lab and sharing with us some great knowledge about the lunar module uh, that we're going to be celebrating 50 years of uh, going to the moon for the last time. We'll also be celebrating this month, the November uh, landing on the moon in 1969 of Apollo 12 when we doubled down on President Kennedy's pledge to beat those Russians to the moon. And we did it twice uh, in, before the end of the decade. So until then, uh, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you in our museum or on Stay Curious tomorrow to bridge the space between us.